All right, well, good morning and welcome to our inaugural Coffee with a Curator program entitled The Stanley Spate Duel in the Antebellum South. My name is Stacey and I handle adult education here at the museum, and we're so glad that you're joining us for today's program and to help us kick off this new monthly series. Uh, the series is part of MOH's History at Home initiative, so if you'd like to learn more about the incredible digital offerings that we have available, you can head over to the museum's website at www.ncmuseumofhistory.org. Before we get started, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our North Carolina Museum of History Associates and Foundation for making this uh, morning's event possible. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like this morning's program happen. We would also like to thank those of you who graciously donated funds towards this morning's program. Uh, we do our best to keep our programming free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping these series going. And we just continue to be so thankful for your generosity and support of the museum and its programs. A few housekeeping tips for today's program. We ask that you please make sure to keep your mic muted throughout the entirety of the program. And that if you have any questions for our speaker, please type them into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of today's talk, I will ask the speaker as many of your questions as time allows. Uh, this morning, it is my honor to introduce uh, the speaker, Diana Belkite, Curator of Cultural History here at the North Carolina Museum of History. All right, Diana, I'm gonna turn it over to you, welcome. Hi, Stacy. thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope we all have our morning beverage of choice and are ready for a little talk about dueling in North Carolina. Um, the, the most famous duel to occur in North Carolina history was between John Stanley and Richard Dobbs Spate in New Bern on September 5th, 19, 1802. Um, so even if you're not familiar with this particular affair of honor, surely you've heard about dueling or maybe the Hamilton Burr duel, which took place two years later in 1804. So for the next 20 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is talk about the Stanley Spate duel specifically, um, introduce the two men involved, describe the chain of events that led to their confrontation, and then compare this specific duel to other duels of the period. Um, try to better understand the honor culture of the antebellum South that promoted this ritual that we today find barbaric. And finally, understand a little better why this ritual persisted in the South while declining in importance in the North. So let's go ahead and get started. So as we talk, I'm going to pull from two noted scholars on the subject of Southern honor and connect their broader arguments to a more specific local story. And you may have heard of Bertram Wyatt Brown, who sort of wrote the seminal work on Southern honor, and Kenneth Greenberg, who has wrote, written extensively on honor and slavery. So let's meet our adversaries. Richard Dobbs Spate was 44 years old in 1802. He had served in the American Revolution. He helped finance Nathaniel Green's army. He was a longtime politician. He served in the North Carolina General Assembly. He was Speaker of the House. He was a delegate to the Continental Congress, the Constitutional Convention, the State Constitutional Convention. He was North Carolina's first native-born governor. And he served in Congress from 1798 to 1801. So really one of our founding fathers, a very influential North Carolina politician. He had been a member of the Federalist Party, but had switched to the Jeffersonian Republicans in 1798 over the Alien and Sedition Acts controversy. And these were laws that increased the power of the federal government and limited personal freedoms, um, especially among those of non-native born citizens um, during a period when there was a threat of war with France. And his switch to um, the Republican Party was offensive to many Federalist Party, party loyalists like John Stanley. Here is John Stanley. He was younger than Spate. He was um, 28 years old in 1802. He was a New Bern lawyer, a brilliant orator. He had been in the North Carolina House of Commons. And in the election of 1800, he beat Richard Dobbs Spate um, in a race for the United States Congress. He was a staunch Federalist, and there had been bad blood between the two men since the 1800 election. 
with Federalists seeing Spate as a traitor to the party. So on August 8, 1802, John Stanley made some comments on a street corner in New Bern about Richard Dobbs Spate. And I'm going to read you the actual words he used because, as you'll see later, the language used in such exchanges is incredibly important. And here's what John Stanley said. Mr. Spate, at the passing of the Alien and Sedition Laws, made it quite convenient to be absent, and although he, Mr. Spate, was a Republican, the Federals could always command his vote, or whenever they were hard run, they could always get in Mr. Spate's vote. So he's sort of accusing Spate of being a political flip-flopper, saying he switched to the other party, but he was still, um, he could still be controlled by the, the Federalists. And these were public comments, as I said, that, Spate, that Stanley made on a street corner. So Spate heard about these accusations, and he wrote a note to Stanley that he had his friend deliver. And he said, these assertions made by you, which is an absolute falsehood, I consider as a direct attack upon my character, and one that I will not suffer any man to make with impunity. You will therefore point out to my friend, Dr. Edward Pasteur, who delivers you that, this, the time and place at which you will give me that satisfaction which one gentleman has the right to demand of another. So Spate is ready to duel from the very first moment, satisfaction being um, the word that they used to, to refer to dueling. So Stanley wrote back, Considering that you are a candidate while I am a voter, that the political opinions of the candidates are fair subject of discussion, I will presume you will, also, you will acknowledge my right also to converse on that subject. And I take it you will admit that I have stated no fact which the records of Congress will not establish. Should this explanation satisfy you, I shall be happy. Should it not, my friend will make such arrangements with your friend as may be necessary to a speedy disposition of the affair. So Stanley's sort of trying to smooth things over while still not backing down. So then still on the same day, Spate writes back again, saying that Stanley had made an improper and unauthorized attack on me which cannot be supported, and he demanded full satisfaction. So he's still very gung-ho about, gung about dueling. Stanley writes back again that evening. This is all still on August 8th. And he was trying to sort of explain his previous words. He says, you do me injustice in the opinion that I intended to asperse your character. I was engaged in an opposition to your election. I was determined to conduct this honorably and surely your opinions might without any dishonorable imputation be discussed. So Stanley sort of says, sorry, not sorry. Um, just sort of trying to explain himself a little more. So finally Spate relents somewhat, writing, but as what has been said may have made an improper impression on the public mind, I conceive it to be my duty to publish the whole of the correspondence which has passed between us on this occasion. So he wants to clear the air by publishing everything that they had written and exchanged back and forth that day so that the whole town would be clear on um, what they had said. And Stanley replied, I am pleased to learn that you are satisfied. You have my entire assent to dispose of our correspondence of today in any manner you think proper. So they've come to a sort of a, a resolution. It's looking like things are going to improve. The next day, John Stanley went to court in Jones County. And when he returned to New Bern at the end of the week, he saw what Spate had published. And unfortunately, we no longer have an extant copy of that text. Um, but Stanley felt that what had been published did not represent the true nature of their previous exchange. So he published in the newspaper himself that, that Spate's account had made him, uh, had portrayed him as having made humiliating concessions. If my first reply does not expressly accept Mr. Spate's challenge, if every subsequent one does not convey my readiness to meet Mr. Spate, then has my understanding betrayed me, and I have unfortunately selected language which does not represent my feelings and intentions. And then he added written statements by his friends attesting to what he had actually said about Spate's voting record. So then Spate replies also in the newspaper. Should anything which I have said in this reply be offensive to Mr. Stanley, I hope it may be settled in a private manner and not through the medium of the press. And then he affects, affixed character references of his own, which is sort of ironic since Spate is the one who wanted to start publishing things in the paper anyway. So not content with only um, reaching the newspaper readers in the town, Stanley printed a public handbill which he had his friends distribute throughout town to anybody they met on the street corner. And in that handbill, he wrote, 
the general has on this occasion attempted to figure before the people in a new character, to play the hero, to strut the bravo, to ape the duelist. As to Mr. Spate's epithets, of which he seems to have a good store, I have only to pronounce that they betray a malicious, low, and unmanly spirit. So then Spate retaliates with his own public handbill, which he has his friends pass out throughout town. In my opinion, Mr. Stanley is both a liar and a scoundrel, and although I hold his character in so contemptible a point of view, yet as he has the confidence of the people of this district, I shall always hold myself in readiness to give him satisfaction, and to assure him that if he asks for it once, he shall not be under the necessity of doing it a second time. Stanley responded, Humiliating as it is to my feelings to fight a man who can descend to the filth contained in your handbill, I shall expect that you will meet me as soon as may be convenient. So, that very night, Edward Graham and Dr. Edward Pastor, the men's seconds, and the ones who have been delivering these messages back and forth the whole time, arranged to have the affair settled behind the Masonic Hall on the outskirts of town at 5.30 p.m., and the duel began with around 300 townspeople as spectators. And as an aside, before we get to the actual duel, these pistols um, that you see the photo of were claimed by an Asheville collector in 1938 when this photo was taken to be those, those used in the duel and saying that they originally belonged to Richard Dobbs Spate. And not to get too off track from our story, but um, these are possibly the actual pistols, but there is some doubt. Um, these both have a percussion lock, which was not invented until 1807, but they could have been converted after the duel at a later date. Um, so the, the percussion caps that are photographed with the pistols is inaccurate, but that could just be a matter of how the photographer staged the photo. Um, but they do have the styling of the time period. So unfortunately, we don't know where these pistols are currently. The, their last known whereabouts were in 1938 when the museum acquired this photo. But it is sort of interesting to think that these could be the actual ones used in this encounter. So returning to our duel which is shown here in a reenactment that's held annually by Tryon Palace Historic Sites and Gardens. Um, the two men walked their paces, took aim, and fired. The flintlock smoothbore pistols they used missed their marks. The men fired again. Spate's ball grazed Stanley's shirt collar, but still the two men were unharmed. At this point, after two rounds of fire, the townspeople begged the two opponents to call a truce. Spate refused, and the third shots missed once more. On the fourth round of fire, Stanley's ball struck Spate in the side, and the respected statesman crumpled to the ground, and he died the next day. So how do we make sense of all of this? Historians have long been fascinated by the culture of dueling. Kenneth Greenberg lays out a formula that he says defines most duels in the antebellum south and I'm going to show you his different steps and that most duels included and we'll see how the Stanley Spate duel compared to the norm. So Greenberg says that the that duels typically originated from insulting words or actions and Bertram Wyatt Brown or other historian we're pulling from said that almost all duels arose because one antagonist cast doubt on the manliness and bearing of the other usually through the recitation of ritual words, liar, poltroon, coward. Certainly, Spate considered Stanley's speech on the street corner to be insulting, and he considered it, quote, a direct attack upon my character. Later, Stanley accused Spate of trying to, quote, figure before the people in a new character, to play the hero, to strut the bravo, to ape the duelist. And Spate eventually called Stanley a liar and a scoundrel. And once the language had escalated that far, the stigma had to be dealt with, or the labels would haunt the bearer forever. Number two, this is followed by a carefully worded exchange of letters in which each party tried to describe how he had been injured. And we saw quite the exchange of letters. Spate said that Stanley had made an improper and unauthorized attack on me which cannot be supported. And Stanley said that Spate's article portrayed him as having made humiliating concessions. Third, there's often an intervention by a third party to try to bring about reconciliation. We didn't have a third party attempt, but the two men did try at various times in the exchange to bring about reconciliation. Stanley sort of half apologized, saying he wasn't trying to asperse Spate's character. Spate's desire to publish the correspondence, to sort of clear his name before the general public, um, brought the public in as a third party to sort of clear the air. 
And the men both listed names and statements of other prominent citizens in their published exchanges as a way of showing support for their positions. So there were others involved. And finally, the duel itself was a theatrical display for public consumption. And that was certainly the case in this situation. Um, it started with a public speech on a street corner. They moved to private correspondence, but then those were published in the um, local newspaper. And finally, they um, started distributing public handbills, so you didn't even have to read the paper to find out what was going on between these two men. Um, and at the duel itself, about 300 people, Newburn townspeople, were present. So very much like a, a public drama. And dueling itself had a script, much like a play. It was based on the Code Duella, which was invented by a group of Irish gentlemen in 1777 to codify the very specific instructions of how a duel should be carried out. So if you've seen Hamilton, for example, you remember the song, The Ten Duel Commandments. That was based on the Code Duello, although the Code Duello had 25 or 26 different rules, if I remember correctly. So what about the culture in the antebellum South at that time made this okay, this type of ritual violence? Seeming, settling seemingly minor disputes through ritualized murder seems bizarre, if not repulsive, to our modern sensibilities. But in Stanley and Spate's world, however, dueling made sense. In the antebellum South, a white man's personal honor was his most cherished possession. Honor being a group of rules by which the community judges your behavior, your reputation for honesty and integrity, your reputation for martial courage and strength, your mastery over your household, including your wife, your children, the people you enslave, and your willingness to use violence to control threats to your reputation. If you were publicly dishonored, you would lose everything. If you were um, a politician, you would you'd lose your elected office, your friends, your business prospects, your business prospects for your children, it was a fate worse than death to be publicly dishonored. And in this system, enslaved African Americans were clearly at the bottom of the Southern social order and were thought of by whites as having no personal honor. Now certainly enslaved people did have personal honor, but it was, um, it was a system of personal honor that white people did not acknowledge or recognize. White women were also considered to hold no personal honor, but their actions could bring dishonor upon the white men in their lives. All white men could claim a certain degree of honor by virtue of skin color and gender. However, those who owned land and enslaved people, and especially those who held public office like Stanley and Spate, relied the most on their public reputations and had the most to lose if they were dishonored in the public mind. And men from this upper class therefore engaged most frequently in dueling. And in honor culture, appearance versus reality is a really important theme. Spate's actual voting record was not of importance. Whether or not Stanley had abused his character was. How Stanley made Spate appear before the public was far more significant than whether what he said was true or not. So <clears throat> let's trace the roots of this and then look at the outcomes. So this honor ethic came to this continent from Europe. <clears throat> and it was very much in existence in continental Europe. France was a hotbed of dueling during the 18th century, for example. And on this continent, it was not initially just a southern system, but across the colonies and young nation. Around the time of the Stanley Spate duel, <clears throat> southern honor was becoming distinct from the version brought over to all the colonies. And now sure, you have the Hamilton Burr duel just two years later in 1804, but by the 19th century, by and large, southerners had a much greater emphasis on the concept of honor than northerners did. And this is paralleling the division between North and South, the growing importance of the institution of slavery um, after the invention of the cotton gin. Um, while in the South, while you have growing or urbanization in the North, honor culture is thriving in the South while diminishing in the North. In feudal societies, um, honor, the honor ethic reinforced the power structure of nobility over peasants. Um, the powerful men are the ones with notions of personal honor and the ones who will fight to the death to defend their reputations, thereby justifying their leadership. In the South, in the American South, you have the pretense of democracy, the feelings that all men are created equal. And all white men had the potential for participating in the honor culture. So it's sort of a democratic ideal, but it was only democratic, it was only a democratic society um, that was democratic for members of a certain ethnic and gender group. Lower class white men also participated in affairs of honor, 
but these usually took the form of street fights, eye gouging, and nose biting, the idea being to dishonor your opponent by disfiguring him. And disfigurement um, and dishonor being in the same vein of appearances being really important in this culture. So at its root, honor culture and democracy are fundamentally at odds, just as slavery and democracy are fundamentally incompatible. Yet in this culture, there is the belief that they can coexist. So the existence of honor culture was very much attached to the institution of slavery in the South. It was an ancient ethic put to use in a democracy to normalize slavery. So let's return to our duel and see what happened in the aftermath. The legal system in an honor-based honor culture tends to be secondary to public consensus. And one example is the anti-dueling laws that many states passed. Um, these laws were often made by the same people who were actively involved in dueling. And if we look what, at what happened to um, John Stanley in the aftermath, that might shed some light. Um, so after uh, Richard Dobbs Spate's death, his friends brought a murder charge against John Stanley. And John Stanley wrote to Governor Benjamin Williams for a pardon. He said, I appeal, sir, to the feelings of every gentleman. Permit me, sir, to appeal to that dignified sense of honor which adorns your own character to decide whether it was possible or would have been proper for me to acquiesce with humility to have bowed myself to the opprobrious epithets of liar and scoundrel. scoundrel. Williams, like Stanley, is a participant in this honor culture. He gets why Stanley did what he did, and so he pardons him. But within a few months, the General Assembly passes an act to prevent the vile practice of dueling within this state. And the provisions of this act are that anyone who participates in a duel shall be forbidden from holding office, they'll have to pay a hefty fine, and the survivor of a duel to the death shall be executed without the benefit of clergy. Now, many states had such laws, and they were rarely enforced again, because the same people who made these laws were the ones doing the dueling. And in this state, <clears throat> in North Carolina, following the passage of this act, many people simply took their duels to South Carolina or Virginia, where the laws were less stringent. So in conclusion, John Stanley lived until 1833, though he spent the final seven years of his life in debt and paralyzed from a massive stroke. He also lived to see two of his brothers, Richard and Thomas Stanley, die in duels. Thomas's um, duel was caused when he threw a piece of cake at a friend as a joke, and the friend did not find it funny. The honor culture that encouraged such displays of violence continued to gain importance among white Southerners. Not until the massive social and cultural changes of the Civil War era did dueling truly die out in the South. And remnants of honor culture remained even longer, and one might argue, some are with us still. So, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, that was awesome. Wow, so much information. That's incredible. Okay, so um, you briefly mentioned honor culture possibly continuing in today, into today's mm -hmm. time. Do you have any idea about how long, I mean, if it's, if it's not as strong today, um, do you feel, I mean, how long did it really take to kind of peter out in the South? Um, I mean, I think it's a gradual thing and like dueling, for example, the last North Carolina duel, um, or at least last recorded North Carolina duel took place, I think in 1857. Um, oh. so, and well, that was the last duel to the death, 1856 in Wilmington, sorry, um, between Flanner and Wilkings. And, um, there was, let's see some dual challenges that were recorded um, up until the 1880s that um, didn't actually lead to anyone being killed. But um, certainly that, that idea of defending one's honor through ritualized violence um, stuck around even past the heyday of dueling, if you will. Wow. Uh, next one is, was it common, was it common, a common practice for murder charges to be brought against the winner of a duel, the survivor rather, of a duel? Um, I know that in the case of the Stanley Spate duel, it was, Spate was, I mean, Spate was a very beloved um, representative of North Carolina. He was um, very widely admired. He had represented North Carolina in so many um, key instances. Um, so 
he had some very powerful friends and this you know 28 year old upstart sort of comes and kills him in a duel even though his fate was you know very equally involved in the escalation of it um was particularly prominent um i think you know that's happened in other cases with a murder charge being brought but it was very very rare that anyone was uh, prosecuted for for dueling since you know as it was usually politicians who were doing it and they were the ones making these laws and um but there was a lot of opposition to dueling people at the time did recognize it as barbaric but um not enough to actually put a stop to it makes sense uh so we have time for one more question um and you touched on this briefly but why do you think that honor culture uh held on or this form of honor culture held on so much longer in the south than it did in the north um because it was very much tied to the institution of slavery and the the idea of the ordering of society as uh, a man, a politician, an enslaver, someone who you know managed his household, held his personal honor in great, um, of great importance, and so it was, you know, sort of this feudal society that was um, this ethic taken from the the era of feudal societies. Um, that was being put in place in a democracy to try to normalize the existence of slavery. And so um, it held on here because of that. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We have time for one more question. Uh, what did the winner, uh, so the survivor, really get? Um, well, he had defended his honor and was satisfied that whatever insults had been made against him were now um, dead and gone. You know, lots of duels took place without anyone dying and they were, both opponents were satisfied that they had, you know, stood on the field of honor and defended their reputations. That's interesting because usually in a duel, you always think of one person dying, but that's oh. interesting. So that's not, not really the case. No. And like, um, a lot of times people would shoot at each other. They would, you know, aim, they wouldn't necessarily even aim at each other. Like with the Hamilton Burr duel, there's, you know, the idea that Hamilton purposely didn't aim at Burr. But if they had gone through the paces basically of doing this and they're willing to put their life on the line, then their honor has been restored. Interesting. Okay. Thank you so much, Diana. This has been awesome. Thank you. Uh, and thank you guys for joining us this morning. Um, if you enjoyed today's program, we invite you to join us for next month's program on Tuesday, November 17th. It'll be at 10 a.m. again. Uh, and this one will be Coffee with, Curate, Coffee with a Curator, Fighting for Women's Suffrage, Women, Women Suffrage in North Carolina with Raylana Poti, Chief Curator here at the North Carolina Museum of History. Uh, everyone have a lovely day. Thanks again.